Today we'll cover module 1.1, learning with derivatives. This is the first module that really starts getting into the interesting parts about deep learning. Just a reminder that last class we talked about the idea of a training data set. We have a set of points x comma y. x is represented as two positions, x1 and x2, which we'll refer to as its features. y here does not represent an axis in the graph. It represents the true color or label of each data point. Our goal was to develop a model that could split these two data sets. So we will do that by writing down a parameterized function m that takes x as an input, as well as parameters theta, which in this case are w and b. We're going to primarily be focusing on linear models to start out. A linear model is written in the following form. We multiply x1 by w1, x2 by w2, and then we add a bias b. We'll be using a graphical notation to represent these problems. In this graphical notation, red represents predicting positive, whereas blue represents predicting negative. While we'll be given a set of example points, known as our training data, the function m can provide a value for every possible point in two dimension. I'll be drawing that as a colored graph, where the line in the graph represents the point where we split between classifying as red and classifying as blue. Here's what this looks like in practice. This graph was literally calculated by taking in every point in the graph, passing it through our model, and determining which side of the boundary it was on. When we have one of these graphs, we can determine how well we're doing based on each of the individual training points compared to this split. In particular, here we see an example where we have the blue circles on the wrong side of the decision boundary. Therefore, these points are incorrect, and that means that we're taking some loss. In last class, we considered a loss function known as ReLU, but I do want to note that we can have many different types of losses. So in particular, this is a picture of a loss known as log sigmoid. This loss penalizes us like ReLU for being on the wrong side of the divide, but it also penalizes us a bit for being too close to the line even if we are on the correct side. Different loss functions have different penalties in terms of our final result. In today's class, we're going to be focusing particularly on this loss function. One thing I want to note is that the loss function is a function only of the parameters theta. This differs from the model, which is a function of the input x, as well as the parameters. When dealing with loss, we'll be changing the parameters which in effect changes where the decision boundary is on these graphs. However, as I noted earlier, the loss is not a function of any individual point, but is instead just a function of the parameters that utilizes the point to compute its final value. In today's class, we'll be covering the main idea of fitting a model to training data. To do this, we'll first talk about what this means from a high-level perspective. We'll then dive into some of the technical details of actually fitting a model, including first talking about symbolic and then numerical derivatives. We'll end the class by introducing module one. As I mentioned earlier, the core focus of today's class is model fitting. If you remember from last class, our goal was to choose the parameters of the model to separate out the blue and the red points. We defined a loss function, which told us how well we were doing. It told us, for instance, that the point on the right, which corresponds to one setting of parameters, is better than the graph on the left. We're going to be trying to find the best set of parameters to minimize our loss. One caveat I want to make at this point is that we'll be primarily focusing on one type of model fitting, which goes by the name gradient descent. There are many, many different approaches to numerical optimization. However, we're particularly interested in deep learning, and in deep learning, gradient descent has become the kind of main standard approach that people will utilize. If you're interested in other forms of optimization, it's a very interesting area, but it's outside the scope of these lectures. In this class, we'll be following the following three-step formula for fitting the parameters of a model. In step one, we'll compute the loss function L theta. 
We'll then see how small changes to the parameters would change the loss. Finally, we'll update the parameters to locally reduce the loss. I want to first go over intuitively what these three steps do before we talk about what they mean mathematically. Throughout these examples, we'll be assuming that we're just focusing on fitting the bias of a model. So recall last class when we had a linear model, there were three parameters or knobs to tune, W1, W2, and B. The bias corresponds to transposing the whole line, so moving it up or down in this diagram. Following our formula, the first step will be to compute the loss. So let's say our parameters have led us to the following model. We can see that many of the points are on the wrong side of the decision boundary. We need to compute the loss in practice to see how well we're doing. In this particular example, we first need to compute how far each of these points are and take into account what their true label should be. We do this for each of the points. In this example here, I am showing a log sigmoid loss. And so we take a little bit of loss from all of the red points and all of the blue points, either way, depending on which side of the line they are. Step two is to find the direction of improvement. If you look at these two diagrams, you can see that they look very similar. However, the one on the right is slightly better in terms of our loss. Step two will be about figuring out which direction is better to move, and in particular, how a small change in this single bias parameter would impact our final loss. Finally, in step three, we actually change our parameters. So given that L is a function of our parameters, we can actually plot the line of L. On the top of this graph, I've plotted out L and shown four different points. Each one of these points corresponds to a different setting of the bias. And if you look at the examples, you can see that setting the bias closer to the origin actually corresponds to an improvement in the loss. So this diagram really demonstrates this idea that a loss is the function of the parameters and that changing the parameters slowly can actually lead to a decrease in that function L. The main challenge we're going to work on today and over module one is this challenge of finding the right direction to move in. We know so far how to compute the loss and we know how to update it, but we really have to figure out which direction will lead to a decrease in the loss and which would be a bad direction to move in. So the way we're going to do this is by using derivatives. This section of the class will harken back to your high school calculus days, and we'll understand how computing derivatives can lead us to decrease the loss in practice. But before we do machine learning, let's take a little bit of a review and go back to calculus. So specifically, we want to review some notation for derivatives and how we'll utilize this notation in the rest of the class. We'll use a slightly non-standard notation for derivatives. Instead of doing the dy dx style, we'll instead write everything in functional form. If we have a function f of x that takes as argument a point x, we'll write its derivative as f prime of x. f prime is a new function that maps from input floats to output floats, and it represents the rise over run, or the slope of the tangent line of the function x at point x. The key idea, though, is that in this notation, the prime actually produces a new function that can take new arguments. Let's review what this looks like in some basic examples. If we have a function f of x, which is equal to x squared plus 1, plotted below, we can then compute a new function f prime which represents its derivative. Here, the function f prime of x is equal to 2x, just applying our standard rules. And every point that is given to this new function f prime returns the slope of a tangent line at a given point. So for instance, if I give it the point 0, it will return the value 0, which represents the fact that there is a minimum to the function at 0. If I give it 1, it will produce the value 2, which represents the fact that the slope of the tangent line is 2 at the position 1. My recommendation at this point is to go back and review some of your standard high school derivatives 
go through a couple examples and rewrite f to its new form f prime. We can then kind of look at this function and understand how we would implement it in practice. Here's another example. Let's say f of x is equal to sine of 2x. We can plot out sine of 2x on the graph below and see that we get a periodic function. If we take the derivative of, we have to utilize the chain rule. Remember, go back and review the chain rule. And you'll see that f prime of x is equal to 2 times cosine 2x. This is a new function with a slightly different form. It's plotted below as the blue line. We can see that the two periodic functions uh, cross with each other. This represents the fact that at points where uh, the orange function is highest, it reaches a local optima, which means that it, the derivative of the tangent line is zero. So that corresponds to the fact that the blue line is zero at those points. On the other hand, when the orange line is at zero, it has its steepest slope. So that corresponds to the very steep and high values of the f prime function. We can also consider derivatives for functions with multiple arguments. So here we have a function f x comma y, and it corresponds to sine x plus cosine y. We can see the 3D graph of this function below. It's quite an interesting and pretty function that represents the fact that we have different periodic structure along the x-axis than on the y-axis. So both of these move independently of each other. We can take the derivative of this function with respect to either of its arguments. Notation we use is f prime sub x for when we are taking a derivative with respect to x. This leads to the result cosine x. Alternatively, we can take the derivative with respect to y, and this leads to the function negative 2 sine y. If we look at each one of these derivatives, they'll pull out only the structure in one of the directions. That's because neither of them include the other variable in their output. This, of course, is not inherent, and they could use either of these variables. But when we plot, for instance, the f prime uh, with respect to x, we see just a cosine structure along the x dimension. That's about all I have to say about symbolic derivatives. A reminder to go back and review the core rules of calculus and be able to apply them to basic symbolic functions. Next up, we'll talk a little bit about numerical derivatives. This is a different approach to compute the derivative function f prime, and it's one that will find use in our implementation. The core idea here is how do we compute derivatives if we don't have access to their mathematical form? For example, we'll have a function f of x, and let's say that f of x is unseen code. We're able to run it, but we can't look inside it. Our goal will be to compute f of f prime. And f prime just has to take some input x and return a value of the derivative for f of x. In this notation, we're thinking of f prime as acting as a higher order function. So we're going to assume that we have a function called derivative, and it can take in f, which is a function from floats to floats, and it's going to return a new function f prime, which also maps from floats to floats. We'll define this as an inner function f prime, and our goal is to implement it in an accurate manner. So here we're kind of just implementing the prime notation in Python code. If you recall, the definition of a derivative is simply defined as f prime of x is equal to the limit as epsilon goes to zero of f of x plus epsilon minus f of x minus epsilon over two epsilon. This is the formula we've been informally referring to as rise over run, here presented in the accurate way with the limit of epsilon going to zero. This formula motivates a convenient approximate form known as central difference. Under this approximation, we can compute f prime of x approximately by just simply computing f of x plus epsilon minus f of x minus epsilon over two epsilon. You can view this as two red points converging in upon f prime as epsilon goes to zero. This really is just computing rise over run, where the numerator represents the change in the functional value, and the denominator is a function of epsilon, the small value that we pass to the central difference.
Utilizing this formula, we can approximate derivatives. First off, we need to actually implement central difference. You'll do this on your homework simply by implementing the math from the previous slide. We can think of central difference also as a higher order function. It takes in f as an argument, as well as a specific value x for which to compute rise over run. Inside this function itself, you'll be implementing the slide from the previous slide, or the formula from the previous slide, which computes this approximate value. Once we have this central difference function, we impl implement the higher order derivative function. In this function, we'll take in f as an argument, and inside our inner function of f prime, we'll actually call central difference with the specific value of x. So every time a user wants to compute f prime of x, we'll find the value of f of x, and then find the value of f of x plus epsilon and minus epsilon, divide by the appropriate terms, and we'll have an approximation of the slope at that point. One thing to note is that this is a simple and powerful idea, but it does require calling f of x at least twice in order to get an approximation of its derivative. We'll see that later on in the class, this makes it intractable to use for machine learning, but it's very convenient as a way for testing that we're implementing derivatives correctly. One other thing to note is that you'll be implementing this on the homework using multiple argument functions. So we saw earlier that for a function like f of x comma y, we were able to compute a derivative for each of the individual values. If we want to compute f sub x prime, we can do this by simply making an inner function that just takes x as an argument and then passing that to the derivative higher order function. So this code below allows us to compute a single directional derivative for a function that takes two arguments as input. This again will be useful for checking that our derivatives are correct for functions of multiple arguments. Finally, let me end by just convincing you that this works. If we have a function sigmoid that takes a single argument, but is defined as a complicated Python function, say with if statements, we can use numerical derivatives to uh, approximate its derivative form. So you might not at this point be clear about how to write the code on this slide in a symbolic way, but you can certainly implement it in Python. Once you've done that, you can call our higher derivative function on sigmoid, which gives you a function sigmoid prime. You can then call sigmoid prime with every input value of x, which is done here, and then plot that to get the derivative of the sigmoid. Let me conclude by talking about the positives and the negatives of both these approaches. For symbolic derivatives, we are able to fully transform the mathematical function and get access to a mathematical function for f prime. This utilizes standard mathematical identities and gives us full access to what we need. Numerical derivatives, on the other hand, are slightly more flexible. They only require the ability to evaluate the function, and they give us the ability to compute the derivative at a given point. However, every time we want access to a given derivative value at x, we need to actually evaluate the original function possibly multiple times. This allows us to apply it to black box functions, but is much less efficient than extracting the full symbolic form for any input x. In next class, we're going to turn to automatic differentiation. Automatic differentiation gives us some of the benefits of both approaches. It's going to allow us to compute derivatives on a range of different program traces. And it's also efficient in that we'll be able to apply it in a large number of parameter settings where it's hard to apply numerical derivatives. We'll also see that automatic differentiation works nicely with Python code, and we'll actually start to implement this in practice for scalar values. That's what you'll be doing on module one. Module one provides a testing ground for implementing auto differentiation and training real models in practice. The learning objectives for model one are to have a practical understanding of derivatives, as well as getting a deep dive into auto differentiation and understanding parameters in practice. So I recommend taking some time to go through the module one setting uh, and get started with some of the different properties that you'll be building in practice. Great, so let's end there. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. Uh, I highly recommend uh, doing this class alongside implementation of the Mini Torch system. You'll get a lot more hands-on experience if you actually try module one in practice.